Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to St. Mary's Perivale on a dreadful rainy afternoon, but we're going to put some sunlight into your lives this afternoon. Sorry about the slightly late start. We had one or two technical problems, but we're in business now. And it gives me huge pleasure to welcome back Mark Viner to give us a lecture recital all about Alcan, that wonderful composer that writes this incredibly difficult stuff in the middle of the 19th century. And Mark is president of the Alcan Society and is in the middle of a huge project to record the whole of Alcan's piano music on about 17 CDs. He's done about five so far. Each is astonishing. I've got them all. Simply wonderful piano playing and very attractive music. Uh, and he is doing a terrific job in bringing to light this underrated composer. So it gives me huge pleasure to welcome Mark to give his lecture. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in from far and wide to this lecture, which I can happily give despite these unprecedented times. Um, I would like to talk principally about the Grand Sonata, um, but before I do that, I will give a brief biographical background and a little bit of context with discussing a few other works. And the focus when I speak about the sonata will be principally on the quasi-Faust movement, which is the epicenter of the work. Charles Valentin Alcan was born in Paris on the 30th of November, 1813, and he was the second of six children of a prodigiously musical family. <clears throat> now, the family name back then wasn't Alcan, it was in fact Morange. Um, the reason why all the siblings chose to adopt the father's first name is probably because it had a better ring to it. Um, K is a, you know, um, an uncommon letter in the French alphabet, and um, I think that's probably the reason why they decided to do that. And they incidentally came from um, the Alsace region of France, and they were a Jewish family. <coughs> He was admitted to the Paris Conservatoire at the age of six, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and he studied with Pierre Zimmermann. And the beautiful pat pastel portrait that you see was in fact commissioned by his uh, teacher, um, probably around, I think it's from around 1834. Um, and it's by Dubuff, who was a sort of celebrity artist at the time. Um, this is the Salon of Pierre Zimmermann, and uh, many of the great and good of uh, the first half of the 19th century played in this Salon, including Talberg and Liszt. Um, while he was studying under Zimmermann, he won um, a number of prizes, including first prize in Solfège in 1821 at the age of eight years old. His first prize in piano came in 1824 when he was 11. A first prize in harmony followed in 1827 when he was 14, and he took a final first prize in organ in 1834 at the age of 21. And uh, it wasn't long before he began to establish himself as one of France's leading pianists, making frequent public appearances, including two visits to England in 1834 and 1835, whilst obviously profiting from the extraordinary artistic milieu of 1830s Paris. Um, Initial rivalry with Liszt developed into a friendly camaraderie and he forged a close friendship with Frédéric Chopin. At the height of his fame in 1837, he moved to the fashionable, fashionable square d'Orléans, where in 1842, Chopin became his next door neighbor. Now the square d'Orléans is a very uh, coveted part of Paris today as it was then, and it really hasn't changed much. Even the fountain you see in that picture was there back when Alcon and Chopin were living there. Um, <clears throat> activity was interrupted in 1839. Uh, we can see this because there are no, suddenly no concert appearances. Um, fewer publications appeared. And this was the year his illegitimate son, Eraim Miriam de la Borde, was born. 
and it wasn't until 1834 that he returned to the concert platform. Now, this is Elie Miriam de la Bode. Also, the name Elie is, er, er, beg your pardon, uh, Eraim, which I only learned recently. Now, de la Bode was a fascinating figure because his uh, birth was registered under the name of his mother, and it says father unknown, though everyone in the musical, uh, the musical establishment, they all tacitly accepted that the relationship between de la Borde and Alcon was that of father and son. He was a pupil of his father, also of Moscheles and Henselt. Um, and in 1873, he was appointed professor at the Conservatoire, and there he ended up teaching a certain Madame Olga Samarov, who later on taught Raymond Lewenthal, who was one of the big pioneers in revival of Alcan's music. Madame Olga Samarov was also the one-time wife of Leopold Stokowski, but she wasn't called Samarov when she came to the conservatoire. Her name was Lucy Hickenlooper, and she was from America. And allegedly, when she first played for Delaborde, Delaborde stamped his foot on the ground in time vigorously whilst muttering an ongoing commentary on how Americans lack talent. However, as soon as he discovered that her name was of German origin, his tone changed very quickly, and she was accepted. How times have changed. He was also the owner of two mighty apes that roamed around his Paris apartment, much to the uh, consternation of visiting pupils. Uh, the apes were named Isador and Sarah. Isador, after the then head of the piano department of the Paris Conservatoire, Isador Philippe, though I'm afraid posterity has failed to disclose the identity of the lucky lady after whom Sarah was named. He also owned 121 parakeets and cockatoos that used to travel with him, apparently, when he did tours, so quite an eccentric, um, which isn't any surprise. <laughs> A further setback came in 1848. Now, this was the same year as the, the revolution, and there was a uh, less violent battle taking place within the walls of the Conservatoire. Following Zimmermann's retirement as head of piano, it was generally expected that Alcan, his erstwhile pupil, would succeed him, when instead a far lesser candidate, uh, Antoine Marmontel, who was really not much more than a theory teacher at the time, was elected due to political favouritism, and this was a position he was to hold for the next 24 years. Um, however, there is a, a touch of irony here, because Alcan taught Marmontel very briefly, and also Marmontel, later on in the 18, late 1870s, wrote a book called Pianiste Célèbre, with the subtitle uh, Silhouette et Medaillon, Silhouettes and Medallions, and each chapter is devoted to a pianist of Marmontel's time. And the irony is in that most of the information we know about Alcan comes from this one chapter. Um, the death of Chopin in 1849, I believe, contributed probably to his increasingly reclusive nature. Uh, he ended up giving two last concerts in 1853 before withdrawing into total seclusion for almost 20, over 20 years. And it was during this period that much of his finest music was composed, um, whilst simultaneously busying himself with the translation of the entire Bible into the French from its original languages. This was an exercise he undertook for his own personal enjoyment. Um, during this period, he actually had um, a, conf a confidant who was Ferdinand Hiller, a composer, pianist, and well-known, respected teacher, who had by this point moved back to Germany, uh, to Cologne. And in one of the letters to Hiller, he said he had just started work on the New Testament, and he believes that one really one has to be Jewish in order to understand it. Um, and again, I say he withdrew during this period, but he was far from idle. This is when the bulk of all the... I mean, the great works were composed. So perhaps if he had got the position at the Conservatoire, we wouldn't have this music. Who's, who knows? His compositional activity gradually ceased. Uh, it dried up totally with his last work being published in 1874. But the year before, in 1836, he made 
a phoenix-like return to the concert platform where he established a series of six petits concerts de musique classique, six small concerts of classical music at the Salle Erra. And the Salle Erra happily still stands today in Paris. That's a programme you see to one of them. Of course, it's not terribly legible, but you know, if you want to consult it, you can find it online. The very interesting thing about these programmes is that the repertoire centred largely around the classics, and this is particularly interesting um, in a time that's so close after the Franco-Prussian War. This activity gradually came to an end. Um, we do have some fascinating information about these concerts in that <clears throat> Ronald Smith was fortunate enough to meet a descendant of Alcan in the 1970s who was at one of these concerts as a young girl. And all she could remember is that he was still playing in the old-fashioned position with his back to the audience. Um, so again, this points at a sort of conservative nature, you know, playing with that, that sort of profile. You know, second half of the 19th century is extraordinary when people were playing recitals with their profile <coughs> shown to the audience as early as, you know, the 1840s. Um, this came to an end and he entered an even deeper period of seclusion, a very scantily documented period, until his death on the 29th of March, 1888. And this was an event which generated such convoluted rumour that until relatively recently it was widely accepted that he was killed by a falling bookcase. Now, I regret to report that, alas, this tall tale is probably apocryphal. Uh, Hugh MacDonald, in his fabulous essay, More on Alcon's Death, is the final word on this subject. And while open-ended, it gets closest to debunking this tantalising myth. There were differing accounts of what actually happened, but the one that seems to tally up in my mind is that he tripped and got entangled in a, a heavy thing called a porte parapluie, which is a, it's, it's an umbrella stand, but they were made of cast iron. And, you know, being the age he was, he may well have uh, suffered a compound fracture, even a break, and how do you diagnose that then? He was found many, many hours later by his housekeeper, and he was exhausted, carried to bed, and there he expired a few hours later. So, really, it's a, it's, it's a sad ending to a rather lonely life that, you know, he wasn't there. There wasn't anybody there to, to, to look out for him. Not that he wanted anybody there anyway. Um, as I said, he was a reclus reclusive personality with strange habits. He used to roll crumpled up balls of paper under the furniture to check that his housekeepers weren't scrimping on their duties. And we think to ourselves today, who does that? You know, th this all points to a, a, a very interesting uh, psychological state um, and the, the, the tale of the bookcase, the other detail that's rather gruesome was that allegedly when they lifted up the bookcase, he was found in rigor mortis still clutching the Talmud, which he was reaching for, which by Jewish law is kept on the highest shelf. Um, this, I believe, was circulated by the head of the Paris Conservatoire piano department, Isidore Philippe, though I think we can discredit it. It has also been suggested that that particular tale was circulated by the Jewish community of Paris because there was a rabbi of Metz who in 1789 died in exactly the same way and who was also a recluse and rabbinical scholar. So perhaps there was a sort of play on the whole thing, I'm not sure. But that's, that's roughly what we've gleaned. There's a lot more and Hugh MacDonald's article is available for consultation in the Musical Times. Uh, of March 80, 1988, beg your pardon. I'll talk a little bit about the music now, though the time I have is far too limited to give a very fair overview to just how diverse the output is. It's diverse in every way possible, in terms of size, difficulty and quality, actually. Um, as a pianist, he must have been in possession of an almost frightening command of the instrument, and it was reputed that he was the only pianist before whom Franz Liszt felt ill at ease to perform. Now, that wasn't just circulated by, you know, pianists trying to have a stab at Liszt. That was Liszt himself who said that. So that's saying something. Um, his music comprises really some of the most extraordinary ever conceived for the piano. 
if we just take the mighty set of Douze études dans tous les temps mineurs, the 12 studies in all the minor keys, opus 39, it is the fullest embodiment of his creative, creative powers. This monumental set of studies runs to some 275 pages and comprises some of his finest music, including a symphony and concerto for piano solo, not to mention an overture and a magnificent set of variations called Le Festin des Op and three other miscellaneous etudes, which also are rather exacting, the first one being Comme le Vent, the metronome mark indicating that it goes 16 notes to the second. Of course, something that was a tall order even back then on an RR of 1850 with a shallower keybed and a lighter action. Other important works include the Sonatine, Opus 61, and the Grand Sonata, which I shall be speaking about principally today. Another set which we really could not do without are the uh, 48 Esquisse, Opus 63. Now, these pieces are absolutely marvellous. They're split into four volumes, and there is a wealth of music for the fluent amateur. It's not all difficult, not by any means. Um, a man capable of writing a concerto which lasts nearly 50 minutes of real exacting demands for the piano could also write a two-line fragment entitled Les Cloches, The Bells, which is just simply beguiling. So I think while one prominent writer described him as an architect of the colossal, he is also a, a, an exquisite jeweller of things which are so very, very fine and wonderful to explore. The esquisse are, have microcosms of all sorts of diverse worlds, times. Much of it is music about music as well. Utterly enchanting. Um, the reasons for the, music the music's obscurity, I mean, many people might say, well, if something isn't known, then it's not very good, perhaps. Well, that's not entirely true. Many times it is true. But there are certain situations we have to take into consideration here. In many respects, Alcan was his own worst enemy because he didn't perform many of his important works at all in public. He did play his symphony for solo piano, he did play the Opus 15 pieces, the Souvenir, the Trois Morceaux dans, les, dans le genre pathétique, but not much else. And I don't think he was ever very interested in promoting his own work. In the correspondence with uh, Hiller, there is not a single mention of anything, not even his Opus 39 studies. So it gives you the idea that he was really a retiring, modest personality and probably had a, fuss of pub a horror of fuss and publicity. Um, the other, perhaps, reason is that the language of this music was so radical back then that people didn't quite know how to take it, and also precious few pianists were equipped enough to tackle the demands that were imposed. Um, and, you know, this was a time when operatic fantasies on, um, you know, famous tunes of the day were really the thing. You know, uh, the public wanted to be dazzled and uh, titillated and excited, and that wasn't really what this music was doing. It had a very serious, urgent message, but it was perhaps in his time the wrong place in the wrong time. Um, nonetheless, those very attributes which probably, I don't know, detracted 19th century ears, I think they conversely attract 21st century ears. And in my, my experience of playing this extraordinary music in public, I've never had a public which wasn't extremely overwhelmed, maybe divided, but still there was a strong reaction. So perhaps today is the better day to, to, to really re-examine all of this. But let me talk a little bit about the early revival. The first serious pioneer was none other than Ferruccio Busoni, who classed him there's a famous quote, alongside the five greatest composers for the piano since Beethoven. Now, this quote is often taken out of context because he wasn't talking about Alcan there. He was defending Liszt. Um, that says something. Busoni, in the early part of the 20th century, presented famously some Alcan works in his Berlin recitals. I think the date was 1909, but I might be mistaken. And in those recitals, he presented the second etude from the 12 studies in the minor keys, entitled En rythme holocique, 
the military caprice, Le Tombeau Bauchon, Opus 50 bis, which is an absolute masterpiece, and the Allegro Barbaro, which in all probability influenced Bartok to write his Allegro Barbaro because the textures and key are very close. There are so many similarities that it just, no way he could have plucked that title and that kind of writing out of thin air. Um, the reaction amongst the, uh, the short sighted among the, the Berlin critics was that it was preposterous French rubbish, um, really lambasted. Um, so Bozzoni, instead of taking umbrage, came back on another se- season. And when he was playing the Beethoven pia- uh, Concerto Number no. 3, for piano and orchestra, he decided to include Alcon's Gargantuan Cadenza for the first movement, which, while being a stroke of genius in its own right, um, heralds in the theme from the finale of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and of course they're very closely related themes. Um, so really hair-raising stuff, and I don't think that, that helped. Um, he also did offer the Etude for the Left Hand, which is mistakenly ascribed to the opus number of 76. But it was clearly, again, the wrong place and the wrong time. Moving on from Bozzoni, Egon Petri then took up the torch. And Petri gave first performances of the symphony and the concerto in the 1930s when he was invited to do so by the BBC. There had been performances of the symphony in Paris by a certain Josephine Martin in the 1870s. But again, the stature of Egon Petri, heads began to, to turn, people began to speak. Sarabji suddenly wrote, thank goodness, an artist of Petri's calibre has taken up the torch and now we can, he can be defended. Um, and we are also lucky to have a private recording that was made in the States of the symphony, which I think was recorded in the 1950s. Um, And it's a fascinating document. The only problem with it is that the engineer, it may have been done by students, I believe it was recorded at a university, they set the levels too low. So at the big climaxes in the first movement, it all goes crackly and distorted. But I I rather like that, actually. Um, It can be consulted on YouTube if you're interested, and it really is a bracing reading of the work. Um, Following on from Petri, the big, first big advocate to devote time and energy was my favourite pianist, Raymond Lewenthal, who was a fiery American and a real force of nature. One can find volcanic performances of the Quasi Faust from New York Town Hall, where he just tears the place apart to hell with wrong notes. He just goes for it and. Also, he, he did record commercially uh, several LPs, and I think probably most importantly, he issued uh, he, uh, with Shermer, the publication, Shermer, the edition, uh, a, a publication of some of Alcon's principal works with a foreword written by himself, which I still think is one of the best things written on Alcon. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still in print today, but one can easily find copies of it, you know, if you search online, and it's a fascinating text. And it did a great deal for the revival of Alcon's music. Um, the, the Shermer edition was published in 1963, and that was a very exciting time. Around a similar time, more maybe a decade later, another pianist took up the cause, none other than the eminent Ronald Smith, um, who is the only one of these pianists I ever had a personal connection with. When I was much younger, I was given the Alcon Toccatina, Opus 75, to prepare for a, it was a piano series at my school where each spring the piano department focused on a particular area of the repertoire. And I must admit back then it was a little bit beyond me. Uh, Somehow I managed and I had a masterclass with him. And um, it was just absolutely fascinating. And what I should relay which I think is quite pertinent here, is that I absolutely detested this little piece. Um, I just did not understand what what was going on. And then I heard lots of other music. I heard the Major Key Studies, Opus 35, complete, which I ended up playing and recording myself. And that was 
that was pivotal. That made me realise, well, one can't just take one thing and say that's him. Now I adore the Tocatina because my ears have been opened. I get it now and, you know, we all change. But that was my initial reaction and I always reflect on that and I think, well, what if I didn't hear the other things? Where would I be? Uh, Ronald Smith ended up recording pioneering, you know, first recordings of the entire minor key studies. And they were issued by EMI uh, in the 70s and many, many of them remain benchmark recordings. And I think since this period, happily, many other pianists have taken up the cause, most notably Marc-André Amelin, who has produced extraordinary recordings which inspired me deeply in my, in my early teens and really ex inspired me to want to play this music. Um, Stephanie McCallum, our president of the Alcan Society, who's made marvellous readings of... Uh, the, of the Chant and the, the Meineke studies. And as a result, many others who are playing, I know more and more pianists playing the odd work of Alcon. Oh, I feel like playing that. And it's wonderful. So it's, it's taken a long time, but we're getting there. Um, now I think I will talk about the sonata. Now, the Grand Sonate, that's the title page to the first edition, which is rather beautiful. Um, and there's a, there's a copy of that in the British Library, um, though, of course, the, the actual text itself is IMSLP, it's online, of course. Um, this sonata, uh, I'm going to start by just giving a little bit about the, the background of it, and then I will speak about movements one, uh, three and four. And then finally, I'll speak about the, la the, the second movement, because that is when my recording will be played after, so it, it will work better that way. This sonata was published in 1848 with a dedication to the composer's father, and while it's, a, it's really an unprecedented event in the composer's out output, it remains a pinnacle of the piano literature, and in my view, it's the greatest French piano sonata. Um, I know there are others. There's Dutieu, uh, there's Ducat, but I do think this one is, is, is really a great work. Um, it was described, its publication was described by Raymond Lewenthal in, as a cosmic event in the history of piano music. Um, though it was a cosmic event that really went unheeded um, for reasons which I'll, I'll go into. Um, we could argue, actually, I mean, I say this is his, his first big structure. I mean, there's nothing to really suggest that something like this would suddenly appear. Though he, we could argue that the earlier souvenir, the Trois Morceaux dans le genre pathétique, opus 15, is his first foray in a large-scale structure because the third piece's recapitulation of ideas from the previous two, uh, it makes the whole thing constitute a single unity through its half-hour's duration. Um, though, I mean, really, movements of these pieces, you can play them separately quite easily. Um, and as a, re as a result, I think the Grand Sonata is, re is really the first of such pieces, large scale to be, you know, through his adoption of and treatment of sonata form. However, it, the principal thing here is that it, it behaves like no other sonata written before or after. And most notably, it's the only one in the history of music where the movements become progressively slower. Uh, it also follows a loose program where the four movements are entitled uh, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, something which, of course, is representing the four ages of man. Now, there's a rather nice, famous picture of, uh, called the four ages of man. This uh, subject has been, it's been a theme since time immemorial. I mean, it's, uh, this theme appears in Ovid's Metamorphosis, Dante's Inferno, and it was a common subject in 16th and 17th century painting, as you can see there. Um, he also, I mean, it continued well into the 19th. There's a set of paintings, The Voyage of Life by Thomas Cole. So this idea of four ages, um, I think, was more prevalent in the 19th century psyche than it was today. Um, 
I mean, it seems quite damning because, as I say, it's the only sonata in history where the movements get slower and slower, and 50 years old is not, it's not old today. So many people raise an eyebrow over that. Um, three of them, of these movements, bear titles. Um, the second, Quasi Faust. The third, Un Heureux Ménage, or A Happy Household in English. And the fourth one, Promete Enchaîné, Prometheus Bound. I should say a very important point here is the additional title of Les Quatrages, The Four Ages, is not from Alcan, and it only appeared during the second half of the 20th century in articles referring to the work. Alcan himself provides a preface to the piece in which he outlines his intentions, and it follows, like so in English in my translation, many things have been said and written on the limits of musical expression. Without adopting this or that rule, without attempting to solve any of the vast questions raised by this or that system, I shall say simply why I have given such titles to these four pieces and have sometimes used some totally unused terms. It has nothing to do with imitative music here, even less music seeking its own justification, the reason of its effect, of its value in an extra musical midst. The first piece is a scherzo, the second an allegro, the third and fourth in an Andante and a Largo, but each one of them corresponds, in my mind, to a given moment of existence, to a particular disposition of thought. Why wouldn't I indicate it? The musical element will always subsist and expression will only benefit from it. The interpreter, without abdicating anything from his individual feeling, is inspired by the same inspiration as the composer. These two things seem to conflict, taken in a material sense, but in the intellectual domain, combine perfectly. I therefore think I should be better understood and better interpreted with these indications, as ambitious as they might seem at first glance, than without their aid. Permit me, moreover, to invoke the authority of Beethoven. We know that towards the end of his career, this great man was working on a thought-out catalogue of his principal works in which he was to consign which plan, which memory, which kind of inspiration they had been conceived by. Now, the only other time Alcon gives such a personal insight into the inner workings of a composition is in what he called an avertissement, uh, literally a warning, but we're translators' notice, to the um, 25 preludes in all the major and minor keys, opus 31. Uh, now, this avertissement you won't find in any subsequent pressing after the first edition for reasons which I, I just cannot fathom why. Um, in fact, we only knew of its existence, uh, I think, 30 or 40 years ago, when a copy was discovered. This very copy is now in my possession. It was given to me by a very dear member of the society around the time I began recording the, the preludes, uh, which are now released. Um, and in this avertissement, he explains to us how and why these pieces are for the piano or the organ, because that's what it says on the title page. Now, for long, a long, long time, we always assumed, actually, he conceived them for the pedal piano, and an anxious publisher persuaded him to acquiesce that it says piano or organ just to boost sales. No, that wasn't the case, because the avertissement refutes this, this postulation, and he gives us instructions of how to translate various tremolo formula, which might be perfectly acceptable on a piano, or fall flat on its face and the organ, and how, you know, how to rewrite these things and reconceive them at the organ. So um, there are only two occasions I know of where he gives such lengthy instruction. Um, to go back to the sonata, now, the fate of it as I was referred to earlier, was sealed when it appeared more or less on the cusp of the French Revolution of 1848, which was a bloody insurrection which brought the artistic life of the French capital to a standstill and witnessed many international artists fleeing, Chopin and Liszt to England and Weimar, respectively, and uh, we have anxious notes written by the former inquiring on his, his friend's safety in Paris during that time. As a result, the work was effectively stillborn, and it took over a century 
for it to receive what is believed to be the premiere. And that was given by Ronald Smith at York University on the 10th of August, 1973. That's 125 years after publication. Um, in all fairness, Raymond Lewenthal did play the quasi-Faust movement, but to my knowledge, he nor did anyone else play the thing in its entirety prior to 1973. And the piece has enjoyed a healthy revival since, and here I feel more inclined to, to, to use the term naissance rather than renaissance. <laughs> it's witnessed a generous flow of recordings, though public performances do remain a comparative rarity. Now, as I play the work, the reasons for this, I believe, are as much due to the work's design as to the rock climbing feats demanded of the interpreter. It's also an awkward customer to programme. Its length demands an entire second half. And opening cold, as it were, with a whirlwind skirt, so with an ample array of perils of its own, before launching into 12 of the most terrifyingly difficult minutes in the piano literature, which is the second movement, Quasi Faust, is a consideration in itself. But you see, by the time we reach the third and fourth movements, you know, which are slow movements, the audience has quite forgotten about the tribulations endured by the poor pianist, and the dignified crowning slow movement is, of course, received with polite, restrained applause, which is more than just a slight peek to even the most self-effacing artist's amour propre. <laughs> and it renders it, in a sense, one of the most maddeningly thankless tasks to perform, though a glorious one nonetheless. Little wonder why Lewenthal, among others, including, um, I know for, for a fact, um, Piers Lane, uh, are, are happy to serve up a bleeding chunk, which is that second movement, Quasi Faust, which can happily stand alone. And of course, the scheme here is quite deliberate, and the work is by no means flawed but it exacts a degree of self-sacrifice of the artist, seldom encountered elsewhere. Now, I'll give a brief overview of the, of the other movements, but the, the main focus will be on the uh, quasi-Faust movement at the end. As I said, the opening movement of uh, 20 ans, 20 years, is marked très vite, very fast. It's a whirlwind skirt, so it's in ternary form with a sort of coda tacked onto the end and it you know closes with a blazing salvo of octaves um it's really rather exhilarating um slightly superficial but again this is t totally deliberate it also uh, includes some rather exotic performance directions like ridendo laughing on a on a trill um palpitant breathless uh, timidement amoureusement shyly and lovingly um, and at the very end, we have uh, the first hint at one of the crucial themes throughout the whole work. This is a nod to what we have uh, described as the Faust theme. Now, the Faust theme opens the quasi-Faust movement, and it goes like this. Now, at the end of the first movement, as I said, it's hinted at, signifying the youth's coming of age, perhaps. And the outline is within those closing chords just there. Um, to move on now, I'll speak briefly about the third and fourth movements. Uh, after the apocalyptic vision, which will be the second movement, the calm and serenity of this third one, an heureux ménage, uh, can be rather disarming. It's, it's um, an unclouded personal contemplation of domestic contentment, and it opens with a persuasive melody, and it's, it all has the carefree flow of an intermezzo. <laughs> And uh, the middle section, again, it's more or less 
ternary form, broadly speaking. The middle section is marked les enfants, the children, and it's all in three-part close-knit harmony, and it's constant sort of muttering semiquavers at a very quiet, dynamic level, which is actually one of the most challenging sections of the whole sonata, I must say. It's, it's very easy to lose one's way. Um, the opening section returns, and there is a very poignant interlude. And in this little section, you will hear a very, very brief nod to the Faust theme. And a few bars later, we end up with another enchanting passage marked 10 heures in the score, 10 o'clock. This is significant, as it's said that the hour of um, 10 o'clock yielded an almost mystical importance over Alcon, and he was known to withdraw um, at that hour without warning, even in mid-conversation. Um, so it, 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 it was a special time for him. And then there's a prayer that closes the movement, and a fragment of the opening comes back, and it closes very simply. Um, it's moving, it's very beautiful, it's also especially moving to reflect that this never happened for him, he never married, and he never had that, that, you know, that domestic bliss which is depicted in this movement. To move on to the last movement, Saint-Quentin, 50 years, he turns to Greek mythology here, of course, Prometheus bound. Uh, Prometheus, it will be remembered, was a titan who was punished by Zeus for bestowing on mankind the gift of fire, and his punishment was to be chained to a rock where an eagle was sent to feast on his liver day after day. Um, Alcan quotes the following lines from Aeschylus' tragedy at the top of the score. They're in French in the, in the score. No, you could never bear my suffering. If only destiny would let me die, to die would release me from my torments. Would that Jupiter had not lost his power. I will live whatever he might do. See if I deserve to suffer such torments. It's marked extrêmement lent, extremely slowly. And the movement gradually unfolds to reveal a tightly organised scheme where not a note is wasted. Um, it's, in terms of structure, it could be regarded as being in loose rondo form. Uh, the opening introductory bars begin with what has been described by Ronald Smith as a uh, the rattle of Promethean chains. Launching us into a sort of harmonic no man's land. Then after a brief recitative, we have a prayer-like meditation in G-sharp minor, which returns throughout the course of the work, and it outlines the, uh, our pro protagonist's once bold theme. The Faust theme, which of course, in its prime, is reduced to grim and foreboding and prophetic to a degree. 
Now I shall um, return back to the quasi-Faust movement, which I'll just give some pointers on, really. I mean, th there isn't the time for very dense analytical discussion, and that would be rather boring, but I think a few key moments and pointers would be useful. As I said, the quasi-Faust movement depicts man at 30, and it remains one of the most colossal and daunting peaks of pianism in the literature. Musically speaking, it's the epicentre of the sonata, and as I said, it does work perfectly well programmed independently. It's also just about the most motivic thing Alcant ever wrote, and the symbolism engendered through its closely related themes and their juxtaposition is complex and has been the subject of scholarly debate and philosophical conjecture. To return to the opening of the work, the Faust theme, which consists of a rising and falling minor third, is marked sataniquement, satanically. Uh, it is, he it is uh, hereafter, it appears in a myriad of guises, as, you can, as you've just heard throughout the sonata, and therefore I believe that we can, si we can consider it the musical embodiment of the individual whose life unfolds during the course of the sonata. The Faust theme in the movement Quasi Faust is answered two octaves lower by a triplet flourish comprising the compass of a perfect fourth, prefixing four repeated notes and a dotted rhythm a motif which has been interpreted as the Mephistopheles theme. Now, all the stuff I say about the perfect fourth and the repeated notes is relevant, and you'll see that as the other themes come to light. That exchange is repeated before Faust exclaims his bold theme in the major, and Mephistopheles retaliates with an unbridled flurry of triplets. These two exchanges repeat before the rise and fall of four rapier-like arpeggios, uh, which are really quite impossible to play as written, and one's better to distribute them between the hands in order to get the speed up, um, which culminate in a clamorous salvo of des descending thirds. Again, the interval of the Faust theme is a third in tremolo between the hands, heralding the theme of le diable, the devil, which is actually printed in the score. The meteoric descent of these thirds perhaps is symbolic of Lucifer's fall from grace. The theme of the devil, in all its pomp and majesty, reveals itself merely as an inversion of the Faust theme on closer inspection, a philosophical pointer in itself, interpreted by some as signifying the potential for evil in all of us or that temptation comes ultimately from within. This is the theme of Le Diable. With the last of his proud exclamations dissipating in a sulphurous haze of pedal, enters the tender second subject. And you might have guessed at this stage it has been loosely termed the Margareta theme. Her theme, marked avec candor, with candor, coaxing and wistful, isn't dissimilar in substance from that of our antagonist, Mephistopheles, witness those repeated notes. And many have commented on its striking similarity to that of Liszt's sonata, which postdates Alcan's by at least two years. similar which list transforms into which we all know and love very well uh, I should also add while list sonata was completed in 1853 and published in 1854 he had been working on it from at least 1849 after <coughs> 
a brief interlude marked passionné, impassioned, and comprising truncated iterations of the Faust theme marked sourdement, mutedly. The Margarita theme enters resplendent in the major, marked passionnément, passionately, before a sort of uh, thematic postlude draws the music to a temporary halt. <laughs> At this point, signalling the development, the Faust theme returns, now in the virginal climbs of C major, high in the treble. This time he is re rebuked five octaves lower by a very uh, concerned Mephistopheles. Faust reiterates, and this time those Mephistophelian triplets spin out of control on a trajectory that catapults us into a seismic hurdle comprising leaps which aren't for the faint-hearted. I shall spare you them here because I don't want to ruin the surprise in the recording. The turbulent development section witnesses both Mephistopheles and Margarita centre stage in an epic struggle where Mephistopheles, reduced to the bare contours of his theme, again that fourth, in hammered octaves, octaves marked impitoyable, merciless, grapples with the placating Margareta, whose impassioned entry in C minor is marked suppliant, begging, which soars aloft a cruelly driven bass marked dur. <laughs> So it's all really heating up. A further entreaty by our heroine witnesses her at the end of her tether, marked avec désespoir, with despair, and the word déchirant, heart-rending, but the verb to déchirer is literally to, to tear asunder, uh, before those black satanic forces culminate in power and sweep headlong to a white-hot recapitulation which witnesses our protagonist in the thick of it. The now familiar Faust theme is etched to the fore with repeated chords and is mirrored by his Mephistophelian double, now with the marking diabolique, all this you will see in the score, diabolical, enchained within volleys of le leaping octaves which cross over, maybe a sig even symbolic of the cross, some have commented. Uh, the Faust theme all at once then takes on a more heroic aspect, its guise more valiant and its demeanour more self-assured and builds up to a blazing climax crowned by four gigantic skyscraper chords which sweep from the bottom to the top of the keyboard, their tops landing on a retrograde of the sequence of notes which follow. <laughs> has been named by Raymond Lewenthal in his wonderful preface to the 1963 edition of the music by Shermer as the redemption theme. And many of you may have noticed that it envelops the Faust theme within its midst. Um, <clears throat> this is the start of the infamous fugue to those who know the work. A second entry enters and then a third and a fourth, and so on. And by the time we reach the seventh entry, it's modulated to the bewildering key of E-sharp major. Um, and it features a unique triple sharp. And man's ten fingers seem a paltry endowment indeed for the task at hand, which involves 11 parts in total if we count the two extra voices and three doublings. All at once, the mists clear and the heavens open for the entry of one final theme in this drama that of Le Seigneur. Now this one, again, is printed in the score, and it's his presence, the Lord, is signified by an open fourth, the outline of the redemption theme, resounding deep in the bass, forming a pedal point. And it sounds like this. <laughs> 
while high above, the heavenly host extols the redemption theme in a blazing pie in which arches to a blinding climax of majesty, only rarely beheld in piano literature. At its apotheosis, the very earth seems to tremble, when all at once enters the Margareta theme, ecstatic with triumph in F-sharp major, underpinned by the redemption theme. Again, the symbolism here, it's, it's self-explanatory. It runs its course and is followed by that earlier postlude before the development, now marked avec délice, with delight, before a hushed spectral apparition of le, dia le diable comes, no sooner to be dispelled by a confident affirmation of the redemption theme. And from here on, the redemption theme forms a steadfast ostinato underpinning the Margarita theme. And it rises inexorably to its apex, but a surprise appearance yet again of Le Diable comes high in the treble. And many have been rather confused about this. Suddenly he enters. <laughs> Because surely good has triumphed over evil. One possible interpretation may lie in the belief that on the day of the last judgment, even the devil himself will be forgiven. Uh, when all will be embraced by God's light and love, it seems a fitting explanation here. Nonetheless, uh, together with the blaze of light, which closes the entire movement. And now here's my recording of this. The second movement of Alcon's Grand Sonate, Opus 33, Quasi Faust. For those of you who are new to the work, I hope the experience is as thrilling as it was for me when I first encountered it. Thank you so much for tuning in.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have been as flabbergasted as I have been by that extraordinary performance of this wonderful piece. And somehow, seeing the score like that, if you're a pianist, you'd run away in horror. It's unbelievable. Mark's just such a fantastic pianist, but also an amazing scholar. And I found his exposition of Olkan and this particular piece quite moving and very interesting indeed. And if you've enjoyed it too, there's two things you can do. Firstly, you might like to buy the CD. And if you go to markviner.com, uh, he gets a bit more of it than if you buy it through Amazon. So he deserves it. So I've got all his uh, Alcandis so far. Hope, uh, so go to the website and buy the CD. And finally, uh, if you have enjoyed it, uh, we'd be very grateful if you could donate to the friends here uh, to keep all these concerts going. We always pay our musicians, and nearly all the mu money goes to the musicians. A little bit goes to the maintenance of this building and the overheads, and nothing goes to uh, us unpaid volunteers. So you know it's all going to a good source. Thank you very much for being with us this afternoon on a rather extraordinary afternoon. On th Tuesday, we have a wonderful Chinese pianist, Kei Ma, K-E-M-A, quite a short name, but a wonderful pianist, playing a lovely program. And on Thursday, we have Coco Tomita, wonderful young girl who won the string section of the BBC Young Musician held earlier this year before the lockdown. They've not had the final yet. Uh, but that's Coco, wonderful player. That's on Tuesday, so lots coming up. Sorry, on Thursday, so lots coming up. Thank you very much for being with us and hope to see you later in the week. Uh, and good afternoon. Mm -hmm.